well, yeah, like, like he said, I stole the best topic. I'm going to be talking about thanksgiving, thanksgiving. And we'll get to why that is applicable to prayer. But first, I wanted to tell a story about the most thankful I've ever been. Right? This is for a material thing. This isn't like you know my wife and my beautiful little baby. I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for them. So don't. This is not about that. Um, I'm incredibly thankful for my wife because she was very nice to me uh, when she married me. And you know, you you sometimes you don't get what you deserve. So um, I'm very thankful for her. I'm like, man, I'm so thankful for all these things. But the most thankful I've ever been for a material thing. Um, is a country market bag, like a, a little plastic bag, you know, the ones that you kind of tie up and then you use in the bathroom um, for the, you know, bathroom uh, trash can. Did everybody do that? Yeah. Nice. All right, good. That's like such a weird thing for everybody to just get on board with, <laughs> but we did. Um, but when I was a kid, probably eight or nine years old, uh, we had a very big, long backyard, and our neighbor um, had a very big, uh, a very big Rottweiler. And so me and my cousins, we were out playing, and we had noticed this Rottweiler for the first time. And it was, there was this kind of uh, little kind of dog shanty thing. Uh, it was not, we did not live in Northville. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so this little kind of dog hut and this large chain. And this dog was kind of like, like you know, looking at us, trying to, trying to get a good look at us. And it was humongous, especially for a little eight-year-old. Um, and my cousin, Andrew, decided, you know, let's throw pebbles at it and see, see if we can kind of rile it up, you know. And so he threw a rock at it, and, um, and it barked and jumped and, you know, like, almost strangled itself jumping off that chain at us. And, and we're like, wow, that is a mean dog. Very scary dog. And we decided, you know, let's, we should probably leave it alone. My brother, my other cousins were like, you know, we're going to go play in the tree fort. You leave that dog alone or else it's going to break the chain. I said, it won't break the chain. It can't break the chain. It's a, it's a chain, you know? And so we kind of threw a couple more. And, this, and it was very entertaining because this was a mean dog. It wasn't like we're picking on a nice dog. It was a mean dog. Not that I have to, like, justify my dog bullying to you. <laughs> But I was eight years old, you know, give me a break. And, and eventually we decided, you know what, all right, we've entertained ourselves enough with this angry animal, um, let's go to the tree fort. So Andrew started going off to the tree fort, and as I was walking away, you know, there's like a little rock that kind of caught my eye, and I was like, this is a good one, you know, this is a good little, just a perfectly round little, I'm just going to, maybe I can see if he could eat it, you know. And I, and the dog snapped that chain right in two. <laughs> right in two, just and it was like, it was like a, you know, a cartoon, like everybody freezes, you know, and then I booked it and my silhouette was still there, you know, just like in dust. And so we're running, we're sprinting towards the tree fort as fast as I can. And my cousin's ahead of me and everybody's screaming now, you know, we're all kids. So it's just chaos in the backyard. And this dog is gaining on me. And I'm the last one, because I'm the youngest, I'm the slowest, and, 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 and it's gaining, it's getting closer, and it's like, tr it's galloping towards me. And, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm legitimately about to die, you know, I'm, go I'm going to die. And even thinking back as an adult, I'm like, I, I could have died, I really could have died. This was a mean Rottweiler, you know, <laughs> probably a fighting dog, you know, this is not like, you know, somebody's nice little puppy, this is, this is a dog that they have chained outside about an acre away from their home. That's this dog, right? This is not like, you know, their favorite pet. Um, he's out there for a reason, and he's so close to me, you know, and, and I remember t kind of turning around, and he's about where that piano was, and I'm thinking, this is it. You know, he's gaining on me. There's no way I can even climb up into the tree fort. I saw my brother get up in the tree fort. I saw my cousin get up into the tree fort, and just as I was about to reach the tree fort, and this dog is now even closer to me, the dog makes an immediate feline to the middle of the yard. And I, thought, what and I turned around, he ran away. And so I climbed up in the tree. And as I climb up a couple rungs of our, of our like wooden ladder into the tree, I turn around, and there's a country market bag that is floating down from heaven. <laughs> 
<laughs> it legitimately was. And that dog shredded that bag into tiny little bits, as he would have my face. <laughs> and it just completely destroyed it. <laughs> and I got up in the tree for it, and I thought, that was a miracle. That was a miracle. There was a, a country market bag came out of the sky, you know, <laughs> ow, and then this dog that was about to eat me decided that looked better, and it got that. I remember being so incredibly thankful for this country market bag. Isn't that wild? That's, I, I've, I've, I'm so thankful for that. To this day, I'm like, what, what would my life have been like if I was mauled by a Rottweiler at age eight? You know, like, like it's a funny story, but I also think, oh my goodness, this, it could have literally changed my entire life. I probably wouldn't be standing on a stage. You know, I would have avoided that at all costs, I'm sure, if my face had looked in all whatever. It was the most thankful I'd ever been for an object. You know, the value of the gift has more to do with the timing it was given and the need that it met than the price tag. <laughs> and when we think of all the gifts that we've been given, you know, sometimes it's easy to say like, like wow, the best gift I ever got was this big, you know, extravagant, um, expensive gift. But I think most of us would probably say the best gift you ever got probably wasn't the most expensive gift you ever got. Right? Can you take, let's take like 20 seconds. I want you to think through the best gift you ever got. The best gift. Go ahead, 20 seconds, and then we'll kind of share. Okay, maybe it was a birthday. Maybe it was a Christmas. Anybody have one? What, what's the best gift you ever got? Yeah. Handmade a handmade Father's Day card. I love that, yeah. Something to cherish. What else? What else? I should bring around a microphone. <laughs> best gift you ever got. Josh, what about you? Uh, uh, a bag of chips from a youth kid. I like that. That's pretty good. Shep? Uh, a backpack blower. A backpack blower? <laughs> nice. <laughs> See, most of the time, it's like, it's not like, it was a new car. It's something that you needed. Or it's something that somebody you loved put effort into. Something that maybe they didn't have much, if that's all they could give. I got for a birthday one, you might have given it to me actually. I don't <laughs> it was one of my students, they gave me a dollar bill. They had a dollar bill in their pocket for my birthday and they wrote on it, happy birthday. And they're like, it's really all I had. And I have it in my car. I've had it in my car for probably 10 years. And sometimes I'm like, should I? No, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it. The dollar bill is worth $4 now. Ten years ago, it was just a dollar. <laughs> Hanging on to it. But I want to let you in on like a little secret that every good thing you've ever gotten was a gift from God. Not just material things, but things like last night's sunset. Beautiful. Things like it's sunny and 75 in late September. That's a gift from God. James 1, 16 through 17 says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who doesn't change like shifting shadows. Well, what does that mean? It means everything you've ever gotten, good, has been a gift. And it's been a gift from a good, generous God. And, and not only that, he goes on to say that God doesn't change. So he goes, you know those gifts that God gave to someone else? He, that's the same God who wants to give gifts to you. He's a good God. He loves giving gifts to his children. But why is giving thanks an aspect of prayer? Thanks powers our prayers because it reminds us of how good our God is. If he did it before, he'll do it again. <laughs> if he did it once, he'll do it again. He's no respecter of persons. What he did for somebody else, he can do for you. And so when we start our prayers with thanks, we actually fuel our prayers with faith. 
Because thanks gives me faith that God is who he says he is. And so I get to keep reminding myself, you know, thank you, Lord, because you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. Well, of course you're going to do the things that I'm requesting now, right? Of course he will. Why would he stop being good? Why would he stop providing for me? Why would he stop taking care of me? He won't. Thanks powers our prayers. But there are two things that will flatten your prayers, like, like a like a pothole and a nail does your tire. And as I wrote this sermon, I was sitting in Panera across from Firestone because I hit a pothole and it blew one tire and then there was a nail in the other tire and so I had to get new tires. And I thought, thank you, Lord, that this happened right next to Firestone. <laughs> Man, how quickly can we go? This is the worst thing. Oh, it was perfect timing. You know, it was perfect timing. Even my, even my bad days are good because the Lord has blessed me. You know, really, I was, I was on my way to a, to a uh, movie because we were watching a movie in our 7th and 8th grade class. So we're going to the movies, a little field trip. And I'm on my way there to meet the class. So I have all, all afternoon. <laughs> have all afternoon. My tire blows right next to Firestone. I go in. They gave me a great deal. I played the teacher card. I'm a teacher, please <laughs> help. <laughs> he said, all right, all right. So I was taken care of. I had all the time in the world to write a sermon, to write a letter. I was able to get a lot of stuff done. It was perfect timing. So thank you, Lord. Even those inconveniences, he can time up and you can be grateful. Thank you, Lord. But there are two, what I'm going to call thieves of thanks. You can write them down if you're taking notes. Number one is entitlement, and number two is comparison. So number one, entitlement. The old question, is the cup half empty or is it half full? Yeah. It depends, right? Do you feel like you deserve a full cup? <laughs> if you feel like you deserve an empty cup, that half empty cup, boy, that seems full. But if you feel like you're entitled to a full cup, then that cup seems half empty. Entitlement creates in us what I want to call a perspective of lack. And it comes from a misunderstanding of what we actually deserve. Whether you know it or not, you've been working your entire life, your entire life, to gain God's blessing. Now, hold on. I know it sounds worky. Don't, don't abandon me here. And you failed. <laughs> the Bible says, you get paid a wage for how you act, and that wage is death. The wages of sin is death. The Bible says what you've been working all your life to gain God's blessing, and you haven't because you keep sinning. That's what the Bible says. And it says you've earned death. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve, and none of my good works can ever pay, they, none of my good works can ever like, like rebalance the scales. I am always at a deficit. I have a sin deficit, and, and you might think, well, you know, I do good things. I, I, I do all this, and doesn't that get me God's blessing? You know what? Jesus gets you God's blessing. <laughs> you know, if you don't have Jesus, you can't be blessed by God. He is the means of the blessing of God. And so I have this sin deficit, which means what I earn in my life is, is nothing good. Nothing good. But it's a gift of God that I have anything good at all. And so when, when we have an entitlement mindset, we go, well, I did this, Lord. I did this. I did this. I did this. God, I've been tithing. God, I've been going to church. God, I've been doing all these things. I still don't have. God, you owe me. God doesn't owe you anything anything, but he's graciously given you his son to pay that deficit. I mean, what did David say? Who am I that you are even mindful of me? Who, who am I that, God, you even know my name, let alone bless me with all this stuff that I have. My goodness. I mean, I look at my life and I think I didn't deserve a lick of it. I didn't deserve any of it. In fact, I deserve a messed up, broken failure of a life. 
We just heard a testimony earlier in worship. God saved me from my bad decisions of my youth. He saved me. I said, amen. He did the same for me, and he didn't have to. He did because he's such a good God. I'm entitled to nothing, which means I can be grateful for the country market bag, which means I can be grateful for every good thing that I get, even if it's just the right timing with a flat tire. I can be grateful because every good thing that I've ever gotten has come from my good and generous God. Sometimes I have a you know, slow start to the day. I work with middle schoolers, so you can, you know, Show me some grace when I say I've had a bad day every now and then. And uh, as I kind of walk through the halls, apparently our principal, Ken Story, can tell when I'm, when I'm a little off. And one day, it was one of these days, I was just a little off, and, and I think he was having a rough day too. And he came in to talk to me and said, you know, I start my morning with, this is how he talks, with um, reading missionary stories of martyrs. I said, oh yeah? And he goes, yeah, and I think the Lord called them to die in Iran, and he called me to live in Northville. I don't need to complain. (laughs) Isn't that great? Like, what a perfect, perfect perspective. (laughs) Like, that is right. He could have called me to be a missionary in Iran. And he didn't, you know, and I'm like, wow, thank you, Lord. Like, I am going to be as joyful and as grateful as I can be. But it's a good perspective. It's a good perspective. I, God could have called me to do anything. God could have given me any difficulty. And he's chosen to be so incredibly gracious to me. Wealthy, healthy, got a beautiful family. Boy, I'm blessed. I'm just so incredibly blessed, and I know all of it is a gift. Entitlement is a thief of your thanks. We got to reject that. I don't have an attitude of lack. I don't have a perspective of lack. I have a perspective of of abundance. I look at my, my life and think, this is more than I could have ever thought or imagined. But God is that good of a God. The second is comparison. There's this wonderful story that Jesus tells. Uh, It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and then sent them off into his vineyard. At about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing around in the marketplace having nothing to do. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out about noon, and then about three, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found some still standing around. He said, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? They said, nobody asked us to work. He said, come, you also work in my vineyard. When they came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning from the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired at about five in the afternoon came, and each of them received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them was also given a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These were hired, uh, these last workers hired, only worked for one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have been bearing the burden of work in the heat of the day. But he answered to them, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Do I not have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus will give give to whomever he chooses. Who are we to be comparative? Again, we get to work for one denarius. (laughs) We get to work all day, right? We get to get paid by this generous Uh, vineyard dresser. Like, we get to be paid by him at the end of the day. We don't have to be sitting begging for money. We have a job. 
Every good and perfect gift comes down to us from the Father of lights who doesn't change like shifting shadows. And he can give us something and he can give somebody else something else. And it's up to him. It's up to him. Paul says the Holy Spirit distributes gifts as he sees fit. God can give you gifts. He can give you gifts. He can give you more gifts than him, than her, than them. It's up to God. Thanks focuses our mind on what God has already given us, and it's not concerned with what God's given others. Thanks acknowledges that God knows what we need and that he won't give us more than we need or less than we need. Thanks trusts God. Comparison doubts God. Thanks praises God. Comparison challenges God. God, you're unjust. And that's a crazy thought there. Because, oh, he certainly is unjust. <laughs> In the most wonderful way. <laughs> God says, do you really want to get what you deserve? We deserve more. Actually, you deserve far less. That's the story of Jonah. Do you remember Jonah goes to Assyria to preach the gospel to the Ninevites? And he does a horrible job. He only says five words. And then he sits on a mountain and goes, I want, you, I want to watch you kill them all. That's what I want to see. And God says, I'm not going to do that. He says, I knew it. I knew you wouldn't do it. And then God makes this plant grow to give Jonah shade. We know the story. And then God causes a worm to kill the plant. And Jonah weeps and he laments. He says, this isn't fair. And God says, did you grow that plant all by yourself, Jonah? No. Do you deserve that plant? No. So why are you mad that I took it away? You don't deserve it. It seems that we agree with God in his quest to be merciful. We agree that it's better that God be merciful than fair. <laughs> it's better he be scandalously gracious than actually give us what we deserve. Comparison is a thief of thanks. And this is a huge problem in today's culture because we all have these little devices that show us how good everybody else has it. And you've heard it before, but we compare our worst to somebody else's best. People don't post their worst on Instagram and Facebook. This is a horrible day. This haul, this stuff happened. You know, they don't do that. They post happy pictures. And then we compare. It's not fair. We're comparing, we're comparing with people who don't even have what they say they have. Do you know what content houses are? Have you heard of those? Have you ever wondered, like you see on Instagram or Facebook or whatever social media app you use, you see these young kind of like hip college kids in these mansions? Have you seen that? Or they're driving around in Ferraris and things? And you think, how in the world did they get all this money? And you're like, this is my mansion, this is my home, what's up, come on in, right? Did you know that it's just fake? <laughs> Did you know that? It's all fake. They, they have content houses where you have like, like hundreds of influencers who each basically subscribe to a content house and there's all these different rooms in the house that they can use. There's pools, there's cars, there's, there's all the cool little things that you would want to put on social media. And then that content house it's a business. They pay to subscribe to be in the house and they get to produce all their content there. They get to take all the videos they want in front of their Ferrari because it's not their Ferrari. Do you know you can rent a Ferrari for $100 a day to do content with? If you want to do a really cool you know, promotional video for your ad agency or whatever, you can go rent a Ferrari. Easy. Like, it's not even hard to do. You know, there's a few sites for it. Uh, just here in Detroit, boom, Ferrari, I want a Ferrari, I want this, I want that, I want an Austin Martin, a Ferrari, and a Rolls Royce, and then I want to, you know, I don't know, jump on all of them. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> it's not really that expensive, actually, but 
what these content creators do is they go rent those, and then they take their video, they shoot their video, they put it online, and people click on it, they get a lot more than what they spent. <laughs> it's a business model. But we actually have people who think it's real. Your students think it's real. Your kids think it's real. And they think, wow, yeah, if I, just, um, if I was just more like them, I could have all of that. The reality is, they don't really have much. It's all fake. The content houses, it's, it's, it's kind of creepy when you think about it. These edited videos, this fake life, and we compare our life to that. I don't really want that anyways. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, make it your effort to lead a quiet life. Minding your own business, working with your hands. <laughs> That's my goal. Make it, make it your ambition, as one translation says. Not to be in the big mansion with all the fancy cars, but to lead a quiet life. Quiet life, working with your hands, minding your own business, keeping to yourself. That sounds like a beautiful life. That's the life I aspire to. So I don't even want to compare to them, but people do, especially students. Watch out for your students because they're comparing themselves to things that are completely fictitious. It's completely fake. Ultimately, when we give thanks, we reject entitlement, we reject comparison, and we tell our hearts that our God is a good and generous God. And we need to practice thanksgiving. In America, we practice thanks-taking. We take something and then we say, thank you. We receive something, thank you. What if we practice Thanksgiving where we gave and we said, thank you, Lord, I had the opportunity to give. Thank you, I had abundance. Lord, you've blessed me. Wow, what a, what a gift, and I get a give. Thank you, Jesus. I remember when I was in Rome, my church in uh, Rome, Italy, is an international church, and they have... Um, a lot of, lot of different nations represented, about 35 in this one church. And there's a lot of African nations represented. And so when they do offering, somebody gets up and says, offering time! And everybody says, it's like, a, it's like one of the African church things, they all say, blessing time! And we play the music and everybody dances their way up to the altar to give offering. It's awesome. It's this, I mean, legitimately, we're, everybody's just dancing person holding the buckets dancing. Everybody's dancing with their money up. To, oh, I got it. I got money. What a blessing. Offering time is blessing time. But thanksgiving requires giving. I want to say to all of you, thank you. When you heard of a need of one of the players on my football team who lost their home in a house fire and lost their father two years ago. You guys stepped up and you gave. And because of your giving, this, this family is doing so much better. They're in a, um, they're in a home right now, a uh, rental home, but a long-term rental home as they kind of wait for uh, insurance and, you know, that takes a while. But as they wait for all that to get settled, but they are taken care of. We were able to get my player... Um, everything he needed for football season because he lost it all in the fire. There's a lot. <laughs> Cleats, mouth guards, you know, uh, girdle pads, hip pads, socks, all that stuff, right? Even, even some hey dudes that, you know, you can wear after the game after you take your, you know, cleats off. There, that's a lot of little things that, that I, you know, most people wouldn't think about after a house fire. But because you guys' generosity and giving to this family, we were able to help them. And we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to give. I fielded the call late at night. It was probably midnight or something when their house was um, burning down. And luckily, the family was out of town. Uh, they were up camping. 
and I fielded the call, and it was, I mean, obviously just devastating. And I just said, Lord, thank you that they were not in the house. Thank you, Lord. And we prayed and gave thanks for what we had, that we have a community that can rally around us in times like this. And it was a blessing to that family. It was such a blessing to that family. It's a blessing to be a part of the church. We get to be generous just like our generous God. And that's true thanksgiving. I want to conclude um, this morning with, I want to practice thanks. I want to practice giving thanks, and then I want to pray, and we're just going to fuel this prayer with our thanks. We're going to remember all the things that God's done. We're going to remember how good, how generous he is, and we're going to tell ourselves, remind ourselves, that he'll do it again. So I'll close in prayer, but before we pray, um, if everybody would stand up with me, and we're just going to go for like a minute. We could do a minute. Oh, yeah. A minute of giving thanks. And I want every one of us, no matter how uncomfortable it might be, to give thanks out loud. Start thinking of those things you're thankful for. And then I just want to list through them. Thank you, Lord. For, thank you, Lord. For, thank you, Lord. For, thank you, Lord. For, thank you, this and this and this and this. And we're just going to give thanks to the Lord. And then I'll close in a prayer. And then I'll invite you back up. All right, ready? One, two, three. Father God, we thank you. You are a good and generous God. Father, we thank you, Lord. We know we don't deserve anything, anything good, except you give it to us as a gift of grace, God. And we're just so humbled. We're humbled by how generous. We're humbled by how gracious. We're humbled by how kind and loving you are, God. And Lord, we know uh, all these things that you've given us are gifts, God, and we just bless you for them. We thank you for your character, Lord, we thank you for your character, God, that, that you stay true to your promises. You stay true to your promises even when we fall short on our end of the bargain, God. You step in and you uphold the covenant yourself. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this world, in this country. We thank you for what you're doing in this church, God. And we bless you, Lord, for your plans for this church, God. We thank you for the carpet and the chairs. We thank you for all the hands that help install it, God. We thank you for the funds to put it together. And God, we, we, we're just so grateful for this space, Lord, that we can host your presence every, every week, multiple times, God, that we can host you, that you would come and that you would be with us as we worship you, God. We just are so grateful. And Lord, we pray, Lord, we pray now, God, in faith, Lord, that you will continue to move in this church, God. God, you will continue to bring people to this church to know you, to love you, and to learn that they are loved by you, God. We know in Jesus' name that convention, God, is going to be a moment that will shift the trajectory of this church in this city, God. We know in Jesus' name that you are going to do something that you promised long ago, God. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be here in such a mighty way during convention, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit should kind of glory would fall in this room, Lord Jesus. That people's hearts would be moved, Lord. That people's lives would be changed, God. That people would be healed. That they would receive deliverance, God. That they would receive that sozo of salvation, God, all together, all at once, in Jesus' name. God, we pray for the light of this church, Lord, that as people look upon this building and drive past this building, even up Meadowbrook, God, that as they drive past, they would feel something. They would feel your Holy Spirit's power radiating 
radiating out of these pews, God, that they would feel you, that they would turn in, Lord, and on a random Sunday morning or Wednesday night, they would turn in and they'd say, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here for a reason, and they'd give their heart to you, God. We've seen you do it before. Lord, you can do it again, and Lord, we believe you're going to do it again. God, we bless you and we thank you, Lord. Go with us this week, God. Go with us this week, Lord. Help us to reject entitlement. Help us to reject comparison, God. Help us to set our mind on things above, God. Help us to remember all the things that you've given us, all the things that you've done for us, God. Lord, we love you. We forget not your benefits, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are mindful of us, Lord. Who are we that you would know our names, God? You are so good. You are so good, and we praise you, and we worship you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Love you guys. You are